All right, top of the day, buongiorno, good morning, come and stay. How you fucking doing? It's Big Rich, Mob Stories. My boy Shattered came through with another interesting article. A little blast from the past, all right? Let's talk about it. The title of this interesting article is, let me say that again. The title of this interesting article is, Shooting Frank Costello in the head and missing and losing Las Vegas. All right, great article. About to share it with you guys. Give me one second. A little mob story blast from the past, as I like to say. On the evening of May 2nd, 1957, Frank Costello died at Chandler's Restaurant at 49 West 49th Street. His companion may have been Philip Kennedy, a former semi pro baseball player who was a sometime actor who managed a modeling agency. Costello likely enjoyed Kennedy's company because Kennedy moved nimbly and freely among Manhattan's wealthiest people. Costello, the insecure Don, was supposedly fixated on being accepted by those folks. The Blue Bloods made him self-conscious about his voice and his inability to lose the D's, Do's, Dem, East Harlem diction. Bizarre stuff for the mob boss who filled Lucky Luciano's shoes, but it is the insecurities that keep us interested in the guy anyway. He took a cab to Chandler's restaurant that night in 1957. Costello routinely took cabs to get just about everywhere. He also preferred walking around with an entourage or bodyguards. After Costello and Kennedy headed to the restaurant on East 55th Street, where they met Costello's wife and publisher founder, the National Enquirer, Generoso Pope. Costello and Kennedy made one more stop down the block before calling it a night. Kennedy had suggested they hit one more place for a final nightcap, but Costello declined, noting that he had to get home to make a call to legendary Washington lawyer Edward Bennett Williams. The two hailed the cab outside Monsignori at around 10.40 p.m. and drove uptown to Costello's luxurious residence, a co-op apartment in the majestic Twin Towers skyscraper one block away from both Central Park and the equally upscale Dakota. Earlier that same evening, two other men had made a very similar trip uptown. Tommy Eboli driving an old boxing protege, a man who looked like his better days were far behind him. Vincent Gigante in the passenger seat weighed more than 300 pounds, well above his fighting weight. He was also armed to the teeth. Gigante had spent weeks working with the revolver he carried that night. He also spent time putting on the pounds. Gigante had been in excellent shape but had deliberately eaten to excess to develop layers of fat that would swallow his muscle. He was changing his appearance to throw off potential witnesses. Eboli double parked on Central Park West near 72nd Street and waited. The cab stopped outside the majestic 30-story building with spectacular views and Costello climbed out and started for the lobby he knew so well. Kennedy paid the driver. Before the cab drove away, Kennedy heard a blast that sounded like a large firecracker. It was 10.55 p.m. Chin had followed Costello inside, sprinting past the doorman, the revolver in his right hand pointed directly at the target. Gigante blurted out the now famous line, This one's for you, Frank. And Costello instinctively spun around and threw up his hands. Gigante squeezed the 38 caliber trigger from point blank range, firing one shot that penetrated Costello's fedora, skimmed the skin on the right side of his head above the ear, and exited out the fedora's back, burying itself in the lobby wall. Gigante waddled from the scene as fast as his plump legs could carry him, not firing a second shot, not even looking to see what happened to his target. All Chin's training, the week spent eating, shooting, and aiming, and the bullet only winged Costello's skull, spilling blood. Some say if Gigante had left out the dialogue, the bullet would have pierced Costello's brain. Kennedy ran into the lobby and found Costello hunched over, holding a bloody handkerchief to the side of his bleeding head. Two terrified building employees stood frozen nearby in disbelief. Someone tried to get me, Costello cried. Kennedy ran back outside to hail another cab. 
He led the wounded Costello to the street, helped him inside the cabin, ordered the driver to hightail it to Roosevelt Hospital on 10th Avenue. Doctors stitched up Costello at Roosevelt Hospital as detectives rummaged through his things, including his pockets. In the jacket he had bearing in the jacket he had been wearing that night, they found the slip of paper on which listed on which a list of numbers had been scribbled. Detectives photocopied it and replaced it. It should be noted that even though Costello was a notorious mob boss, a major investigation was launched to hunt down whoever was responsible for the shooting. Some 66 detectives probed the Costello shooting. Costello learned about the church through his pockets only when he was hauled before a grand jury and confronted with the photocopy of that slip of paper. Prosecutors asked him to explain what the following meant. Gross casino wins of four twenty six fifty seven six hundred and fifty one thousand dollars. Casino wins less markers four hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars. Slot wins sixty two thousand dollars. That was followed by a list of amounts paid to Mike, Jake L and H. Costello refused to comply. The detectives were annoyed and shipped them off to Rikers Island for contempt. Working with the Nevada State Gaming Commission, NYPD law enforcement figured out the numbers match exactly a then recent week's gambling revenues from the Las Vegas Strip's new Tropicana Hotel. Costello's path to an interest in the Tropicana had been exposed. Philip Dandy Phil Castell, who allegedly killed himself shortly after Luciano died in exile, was an associate of Arnold Rothstein, the criminal genius who taught a generation of mafiosi and associates how to earn, among other things. Following Rothstein's death in 1928, Castell went to work for Costello, also a former Rothstein associate. Castell, la Castell later moved from Manhattan, where he was born to a Jewish family on the Lower East Side, to New Orleans to establish a slot machine operation for Costello in the 1930s. Between 1935 and 1937, Costello and Castell earned an estimated amount of more than $2.4 million from slot machines alone. That's the 35, 1935 and 1937. You understand what I'm saying? $2.4 million back then, according to federal authorities. By the 1940s, Costello and Costello, that's Castell with a K and Costello with a C, had opened high-class gambling casinos in New Orleans from which they earned additional millions. It was around that time that Costello allegedly committed his one and only act of violence. Castell, in daily contact with with the New York mobster had reported his suspicion that the casino employees had been skimming from the slot machines. Costello said he would handle the matter personally. He flew down to the Big Easy, called a meeting of quite literally everybody, Costello's entire organization, including bagmen and assorted thugs and associates, and Costello allegedly called out the suspected thief. He asked the man to explain himself as certain accusations had been made. While the man spoke, Costello, unnoticed by most, had reached under the podium to grab a wrench that he used to bash the suspect in the head. Costello told the man to return to his seat once he regained consciousness. Costello bluntly told the audience the facts of life. Costello eventually hauled up stakes for Las Vegas. He, in partnership with Costello, played a key role in the formation of the Tropicana among other hotel casinos. Castell and Costello also were key investors. The Nevada Gaming Control Board traced the Costello link to the two rogue employees, Executive Director Louis Lederer and Cashier Michael Tonico. The two promptly left the Tropicana. Their departures, combined with the casino's announced intent to repay Castell's investment, satisfied the powers that be that the Tropicana would, in the future, be as clean as its neighbors on the Strip. Castell remained in his apartment at the Claiborne Towers in New Orleans until August 16, 1962, where his body was found. 
he had been killed by an apparently self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. November that year, it was Albert Anastasia's turn. He was shot to death in the Park Sheraton Hotel's barbershop. Then age 55, the burly, beetling Lord High execution of the old murder ink mob was shot to death by hired killers of his own kind in the Park Sheraton Hotel, 7th Avenue and 55th Street. Of the 10 bullets fired at him, five penetrated the Mad Hatter. A hail of 10 bullets, more likely than not, they realized the futility of the one-shot attempted hit. Who knows for sure, but it seems they weren't taking any chances after the failed Costello hit. Not long after his infamous execution, Anastasia's family departed the Mafia Don's North Jersey Fort Lee 25 room mansion. So salute to my boy Shatter. Thank you for the story. The story comes from Cosa Nostra News, by the way of Ed Scarpo. And again, thank you, Shattered, for sending me the story. A nice throwback, a nice flashback to some old mob stories and some gentlemen that were running shit back in the days. Millions off of slot machines in the late 30s. You know what kind of power that is? Insane. All right, salute, salute again. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and don't forget, we'll be back tomorrow morning, Wednesday for the morning show. Salute.